Welcome back to another episode of Cinema History. I really wish that this would have come a little bit sooner, although I probably would have done a completely different story had I had the time. I have not had time at all. It's been a bit ridiculous. So I'm just going to hop into it since it's been way too long as it is. Here we go. Born on May 6th in 1895 as Rodolfo Alfonso Raffaello Pierre Filiberto Guglielmi di Valentina di Antanguola. Got it. <laughs> in Castellanita, Italy, Rudolf Valentino, as he would come to be known, would emigrate to the United States at age 18 and eventually become known to film audiences as the Latin lover. As a child, he was pampered by his mother because he was a very nice-looking child, I guess. He was an attractive little boy. He was adorable, so he was very pampered. But because he was so spoiled, he performed poorly in school, which did not make his father, Giovanni, very happy. Unfortunately, his father died of malaria when Rudolf was 11. Same as Roscoe Arbuckle, who was a contemporary of his. But anyway, he was eventually enrolled in an agricultural school as traditional schooling didn't seem to be a good fit for him. And that school was in Genoa and he earned himself a certificate there. He was also in Paris for a short period of time around 1912. And then he went back to Italy and attempted to find work to no avail. So he decided to emigrate to the United States and he was processed at Ellis Island on December 13, 1913. Valentino tried his hand at bussing tables, but his charming personality could not seem to overcome his lackluster work ethic and he was let go. He was then hired as a tango dancer in 1914 by restaurateur Joe Pani for $50 a week. This line of work seemed to suit him better, and eventually he found his way into taxi dancing, I almost said driving, but dancing, so called because taxi dancers, like taxi drivers, are paid according to the length of time that the dancer would dance with their customer. Sometime around 1917, Rudolf would befriend Chilean heiress Blanca de Sales who would soon after file for divorce from her husband John, claiming infidelity. Valentino testified in her divorce trial that John DeSalles was involved with his own dancing partner, Joan Sawyer, who was a pretty famous dancer at the time. Blanca was favored in the divorce, and because of this, John used his political connections to have Rudolph arrested on flimsy vice charges with a well-known madam. The evidence was pretty flimsy, so his bail was dropped. He ended up eventually getting out on bail, the charges were dropped, and his reputation was ruined. He couldn't get a job anywhere, and even Blanca had cut him off. At the same time that he got out of jail, Blanca went over to John's house to collect her child as per their custody agreement, which John was not honoring, and she shot him to death. Despite Blanca having cut Valentino off, he was concerned that he might be called in to testify yet again at this majorly scandalous trial, and so he joined a traveling musical troupe. He skipped and Blanca was acquitted. She was a darling of the media and the suffragette movement, and the custody agreements and divorce terms of the day were considered to be very misogynistic or something. Anyway, so she got off scot-free. She took a gun to his house, held it to his head, demanded her child. He should have been honoring the custody agreement, but uh, he tried to take the gun away from her, and she shot him to death. Yep. So the musical troupe traveled to Utah and then disbanded in late 1917, around the same time the trial was going on, so that didn't last very long. 
and Valentino had to find something else, which he did rather quickly, and he joined an Al Jolson production of Robinson Crusoe Jr. And then he did bit parts and other stage productions, traveling around, and then he befriended an actor named Norman Carey, who convinced him that he should try film. They moved to LA together and got an apartment, you know, split in rent because they were both poor, the usual thing. And Val Valentino got by dancing and teaching dancing, and he became very popular among wealthy older women. Some form of clientele. I don't know if he was teaching them dance, I, I assume, or if he was doing like taxi dancing again and dancing with these elderly wealthy women. <laughs> um, and they would loan him their luxury cars, so that's cool. At some point, he and Norman both attempted to get into the Canadian Air Force to join World War I, but that didn't pan out. I'm not sure the reasoning, probably because they weren't Canadian. I don't know how much they cared back then, but... Also, Rudolph Valentino never went through the naturalization process, so he retained his Italian citizenship for his entire life. Which, that's fine. I just, I'm just throwing that out there as a little fun fact. <laughs> so because Rudolph Valentino was doing quite well with the dancing, teaching, dancing business, he ended up moving out on his own to Sunset Boulevard, and he was getting cast in small parts or as criminals in films due to his exotic look not being the ideal yet. By 1919 he had carved out a nice little place for himself in the cinema industry and was made a lucrative offer from Metro, which was the forerunner for MGM, you know, Metro Goldwyn Meyer. He impulsively married friend Jean Acker that same year. Like they met, they became friends, got married. <laughs> But she immediately regretted it, reportedly locking him out of their honeymoon suite on the wedding night. Sad face. <laughs> they became estranged pretty quickly, and Acker reportedly sued him for the right to be called Mrs. Rudolph Valentino, even though they had never consummated the marriage. And because of this, they were cold toward each other for several years. They did end up kind of settling things and becoming friends again after a few years. As it turns out, it was kind of an open secret at the time. She was in a relationship when they got married and supposedly married him to kind of take some heat off of herself because she was a lesbian. And she would eventually settle down. She, well, she also had, they were estranged. So I don't know how much emphasis I would put on, and they had never consummated their marriage. So I don't know how much emphasis I would put on the word affairs, but she did have relationships with two women, at least, during their marriage. Which wasn't much of a marriage, so again. Um, she would eventually settle down with a former Ziegfeld Follies girl named Lillian Chloe Carter. I believe they met around 1933-ish because they were already kind of in a relationship by 1934 and they moved in together, you know, they lived together for decades until Jean Acker's death in 1978 at the age of 85. Valentino's big break would come with his being cast in The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which was released in 1921, and would be one of the first films to ever gross a million dollars at the box office, and the sixth highest grossing silent film of all time. I don't know why that's a tongue twister, but that is a tongue twister. He and the director, Rex Ingram, not to be confused with the pioneer black actor of the same name, also sort of a contemporary. Anyway, Rex Ingram, the director, did not get along with Rudolph Valentino 
So Rex would use his pull, supposedly, allegedly, at Metro to make sure Valentino was not given a raise or a good part in his next film, which was a B-movie called Uncharted Seas. His next film after that was Camille, a project with Natasha Rambova, June Mathis, who had him cast in The Four Horsemen, and Oh, Ala, Aya, some spellings are A-L-I-A, so Aaliyah, I don't know. Nasimova, who was one of his ex-wife, Jean Acker's lovers. And the woman, uh, Nasimova, was the woman who coined the term sewing circle for women in the film industry who were lesbian or bisexual. It's kind of a shh, -sh kind of thing, little mm -mm kind of term. So... That was her. Okay. And they worked together, the four of them, on Camille. I don't know why I'm talking like this. <laughs> Valentino made one more film for Metro, The Conquering Power, and then promptly scooted to New York to meet with French producers. He was wanting to make films for European production companies. He felt like they were just better. Better production companies, better to work for, better product in the end, all that. All around, in every way that they could be better, he felt that they were better. So he went to meet with French producers and ended up joining Adolf Zucker and Jesse L. Lasky's more commercially minded company, Famous Players Lasky Corporation, where he solidified his image as the Latin lover in the film The Chic in 1921. The film was a hit. His next films were similarly geared toward capitalizing on his exotic name and appearance, and he was given typical leading man roles of the time, but with more ethnic-sounding character names. That kind of thing was all the rage back then. I mean, the chic. He wasn't even Middle Eastern. He was Italian, but he had dark hair and dark eyes, so woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. So the film he considered to be his best of all time was Blood and Sand, and it was released in 1922, breaking attendance records. It was at this time that he married his former co-star Natasha Rambova in Mexico. They kind of eloped over there, but his divorce from Gene Acker, remember they had just been estranged and not really divorced, had occurred less than a year prior, which was California law at the time. Your divorce is finalized and you have to wait a year before you can remarry. I don't know why, but that was the law at the time and they got married within that year. So when they returned from Mexico, <laughs> wherever they were in Mexico, he was charged with bigamy and then they were forced to annul the marriage and separate for a year. It was during the separation that he made the film The Young Raja. It was not well received and Valentino blamed it on his performance, saying that he simply missed Natasha too much, like he did a bad job because he was overcome with emotion and missing her yada yada. So he rejoined her in New York and they were followed everywhere by journalists. They weren't technically supposed to be together. So they ended up taking separate apartments in New York. They would remarry on March 14th, 1923 in Crown Point, Indiana, which I say with so much enthusiasm because uh, I lived down there for a short time when I was very little. It's also where John Dillinger was held and escaped from that jail, yeah. And they also made the film about it, which I'm pretty sure Johnny Depp starred in. I think. I can't remember the name of that movie. Anyway, it's about John Dillinger and yeah, good times and when he escaped from there, so, so that it could be somewhat authentic. So they remarried in Crown Point, Indiana, so they could be officially married, stay married, not worry about all that. Rudolph's luck around this time, uh, well, the year prior, they got married in 1923, early in the year, 
His luck kind of started to turn a bit sour in 1922. He went on a one-man strike against famous players, upset that as a leading man, he was making $7,000 less per week than Mary Pickford had been making six years prior. He was making, I believe, $1,250 a week at that point, which sounds like good money to me. <laughs> and this was 1922. So that's very good money. But he wasn't making as much as Mary Pickford, and he was now a big box office draw, so he's trying to negotiate, and Famous Players was like, we don't care. <laughs> so he refused to accept paychecks from them until the matter was settled. He owed them money, though, for what had been loaned to him during his divorce trials. Like, he had to pay off Gene Acker, and so he owed Famous Players money, but he also wasn't accepting paychecks from them, but also he wanted more money from... I guess he was trying to take a principled stance, like, I'm not doing anything with you, I am cutting you off until you do the right thing and pay me more. So he was trying to be very principled about it, but it also kind of didn't make that much sense otherwise. It wasn't a great negotiation tactic, and they didn't really care for it, but... but... to his almost advantage, it would have been an advantage, they were kind of losing money because they had been forced to pull Roscoe Arbuckle films at that same time because of, you know, that whole thing happening, all those trials going on, and it was, it was bad. So they really needed a star, and Rudolph Valentino was one. So they were going to offer him $7,000 a week, which is still less than Mary Pickford had been making. But there was some sort of misprint or misreporting on the whole thing about whether or not they were going to counter sue or something. And so Valentino got this bad impression of what was going on, so he just immediately angrily rejected their offer. He didn't think about it, didn't wait to really hear from them or let them clarify the situation and that the reporters had just gotten it wrong. He's like, no, how dare you? So he rejected it. Yeah. So the communication was basically non-existent. And then Valentino went and did this whole plea to the public in the press about how he needed more artistic control over his projects, which was a pretty common complaint amongst film stars at the time. But he was also asking for more money and all of this, and he was making more money than the the average person, so the public was really unsympathetic. They're like, yeah, whatever. I don't know what he was expecting would happen, that maybe they would, there would be an outcry of support for him and would sway, you know, here's your audience and what they want. They want you to pay me more. I guess that was probably his angle, but it did not work because they're like, yeah, dude, you're super rich and out of touch. They liked his movies, but once this happened, it was kind of... it wasn't a good look. So while he's going into the papers and saying all these things and trying to curry favor with the public, who had liked him before, he just didn't seem to understand the average person. He really was pretty out of touch at that point. Famous players said in the press that with his legal disputes, the bigamy charges, and getting remarried, and all this stuff going on, that he was more trouble than he was worth to them. Because at that time, especially after the Roscoe Arbuckle scandal and all of that, the actors' reputations really influenced how audiences perceived the whole film industry and whether or not they would go to see movies and all of that. It was very important to them to make sure that everyone looked very squeaky clean in the papers. So to them, he was more trouble than he was worth, or at least they said that to kind of nudge him to being reasonable. But because he had rejected their offer <laughs> extremely unreasonably, they decided to be extra petty <laughs> and extend his contract so that he could not, because it kind of went on a while, all this crud with them. They extended his contract so he could not accept projects from other studios while simultaneously refusing to give him work, 
not that he would have taken it anyway. You know, he's not taking paychecks from them, he's not going to take work from them. He filed an appeal about the contract extension so that he was granted the ability to do some work besides acting. So he could work, but it could not be on the screen at that point until the contract ran out. The other thing that famous players said in the papers during all of this was that he acted like a diva, which I just think is really funny and also fair. Very fair. He totally did act like a diva and it was a little pitiful. At some point in the early 20s, he took up poetry, he published some of his work, and he had other interests, obviously. That was something else he could do besides acting during this scandal with famous players and the dispute and hubbub there. And so he had some works published, I don't remember what they're called. I didn't write it down, I'm terrible. Okay, but you can look up his works yourself. He also did two song recordings, I think, but apparently his pronunciation of some of the words, because it was more Spanish, I think it was supposed to be some sort of promotional thing for some of the films he made, and it was supposed to be in Spanish and his pronunciation kind of sucked, <laughs> I guess. So they didn't release it. I think they survived, the recording survived. You know, there were all those studio fires that happened because they were doing all this stuff on nitrate film, which is super flammable. So a ton of films and audio recordings, music from that time frame have been lost, which is terribly sad, but I've talked about it in a different... I think the Valeska Surratt video that I did because there are no surviving works of hers due to a fire at Fox Film Vault. Anyway. So, he did some of that as well, and I believe they survived, the two songs or whatever that he recorded. And he also took up boxing for some reason. I didn't, I couldn't tell if it was supposed to be for a film, didn't say. Um, but he trained with THE Jack Dempsey, heavyweight legend Jack Dempsey. And Jack Dempsey had said of him later, he was the most virile and masculine of men. The women were like flies to a honeypot. He could never shake them off anywhere he went. What a lovely, lucky guy. <laughs> I just love that quote. That's great. Unfortunately, that opinion was not shared by all, and Valentina was plagued his entire career by some of the public's perception that he was too effeminate and malicious rumors swirled even after his death that he had been gay. The claims about which were all proven false. There was somebody that said that they, some guy had said that they had had an encounter somewhere and it was proven that Valentino was not even in the same state as this guy when he said that occurred. There's really no proof that he was, it's just at that time something that people could throw around to ruin someone's reputation and for some reason he wasn't well liked in the industry it seemed. Men didn't seem to care for his movies. Women loved his movies and thought he was very... but men just didn't didn't like his look or whatever. I mean I've seen pictures and I guess I can see it in some of them but he doesn't seem effeminate to me. I don't know. There's, you know, a spectrum. So because of all of these rumors and just he, things would be in the press about him being effeminate or whatever or repulsing to the average man and he wasn't masculine enough and just kind of picking at him and he would apparently carry around newspaper clippings about this with him so that he could like pull them out and criticize them and rail about them. He, he was so painfully self-conscious about his public persona, and I find that very sad that he actually carried that stuff around with him. Kind of speaks to a little bit of an unhealthy mindset. I don't think he was prepared, and someone else had said this of him that knew him, not in so many words, but it seemed like he really was not prepared for fame and didn't know what to do with it. Who really knows, before they get famous, what to do with fame? It's a constant invasion of your privacy and there's only so much you can do to 
shield yourself from that and then it's just constant opinions of other people on you and that can be rough and he really struggled with that. Soon after his disputes with famous players about his pay and all of that, oh gosh never mind, oh, where did that come from? I'm trying to not sneeze again. So you know the thing in <laughs> old movies like in Snow White, Sneezy, they're always sticking their fingers under his nose? That always seems stupid to me, but I learned later that if you push, that's what it is. They're pushing on the cartilage here and it sort of relaxes the membranes inside your nose so you don't have that sneezy sensation. Just a random pro tip since I am struggling to not sneeze. It's not a perfect solution, but it can help. It did. It helped, so pro tip. <laughs> Soon after the disputes with famous players about his pay and all that, he was hired by Mineral Lava. I'm assuming that's how you say it. Mineral Lava? I mean, it's Mineral Ava, is how it's spelled. Anyway, Beauty Clay Company to do a dance tour promoting their beauty products, as he had kind of gained prominence first as a dancer. As the Latin lover, had such a large female following. Who better to promote our beauty products than a man? <laughs> but it's just women loved him and so they would pay attention to what he did. And it was a huge success. He toured in 88 cities in the United States and Canada. Canada was at the tail end of the tour. And he returned to the US and entered into a new contract with Ritz Carlton Pictures working with famous players for six films altogether and it was negotiated that they would well it was kind of with him and his wife Natasha Rambova they kind of worked together because she directed films and he acted in them so they were going to do two first with famous players and then the remaining four with Ritz Carlton that was the contract not a single one of the films that they made under this contract were successful. Natasha directed the first and it did so poorly that she was barred from the rest of her own husband's film sets. The next film had a weak plot. The third had to be rewritten and caused personal problems between the Valentinos and June Mathis who was the original writer and was basically the whole reason that Valentino even had a career because she had gotten him hired on The Four Horsemen that she had also written. And then the next two films, so that's three, okay, the two famous players films, one Ritz Carlton film, and then the next two were so far over budget pre-production that Ritz Carlton terminated the contract with Rudolph early. They're like, nah. You're spending way too much on costumes. They were fabulous, by the way, but way too much money. We don't have this budget for costumes. What are you doing? So they terminated the contract and thus ended his contract altogether and his dealings with famous players and Ritz Carlton. Now, during the time that he still had the contract with Ritz Carlton, he was secretly approached by none other than Charles Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks to join their group, United Artists. He had to be quiet so that he wouldn't breach his contract, but then it was terminated. So his contract with United Artists, Chaplin's group, was for $10,000 a week for only three films a year, and then he would get percentages from the films, the profits, and he had a fair bit of artistic control. It's like a dream come true. As long as his wife, Natasha, was not allowed on set. That was a condition of the contract. And he accepted it, which started a major rift in their marriage. <laughs> they would later divorce in 1925. She had said after that he accepted the contract with United Artists and then she kind of went off and said she needed a marriage vacation. And then they got divorced. 
It was a very bitter divorce, and he reportedly bequeathed her a single dollar in his will. It's like, when I die, you can have a dollar. Woo! His final film was The Son of the Sheik, which premiered on July 9th of 1926. He would reconcile with June Mathis, who had not spoken to him for two years, apparently one of many friends who had been driven away by Natasha. It seemed like nobody liked her. She was controlling, apparently. I wasn't there, but it doesn't seem like anybody liked her, because once they were divorced, he kind of started picking back up again. But just a few weeks later, on August 15th, Valentino collapsed at the Hotel Ambassador in Manhattan and was rushed to the hospital. He was diagnosed with appendicitis and gastric ulcers. Surgery was performed immediately. There was no appendicitis. The ulcers had perforated, which mimicked the symptoms of appendicitis. But then he developed peritonitis, which if you remember from my Roscoe Arbuckle video, is inflammation of the abdominal wall. But the doctors were optimistic about his condition by the 18th, three days later. By the 21st, however, three days after that, his condition had worsened. He had developed severe pleurisy, which is inflammation of the membranes that line the lungs and the chest cavity. But the doctors withheld their opinion from him that his situation was dire. He thought he would recover. This was his impression. He's like, I'm getting better. It's great. Not knowing that he was septic, he chatted with the doctors on the morning of the 23rd before slipping into a coma and passing away just a few hours later, at the age of 31. 100,000 people flocked to the funeral to pay their respects. It was absolute pandemonium. I'm going to try and insert a little video I found that's actual literal footage of the streets of New York on the day of his funeral. It's bonkers. 100,000 people were cram-packed in this tiny little area around this one funeral home, which was like the Frank Campbell, I think. I know it was Campbell, but I, I don't remember. Anyway, that's where he was. The funeral was held and it was whew, so many people in such a small spot. It was crowded even by New York standards. It's like New Year's Eve at Times Square crowded for a funeral. They were not prepared. <laughs> so, let's go back to the year 1922. Rudolph Valentino was in San Francisco and he walks into a shop and spots a ring. It was known as the Destiny Ring. How fitting. A simple band with a tiger's eye quartz crystal. It was hardly a luxury piece, but he had to have it. The shopkeeper tried to refuse the sale, claiming the ring's previous owners had all suffered misfortune, and he believed the ring to be cursed. Valentino insisted, and he wore the ring through the entire production of The Young Raja, his first box office flop. Remember? The one that he thought was due to poor performance because he was away from Natasha and missed her so badly. Which maybe that was the reason. Maybe. But he put the ring away for several years. And then he brought it back out for The Son of the Sheik, his last film. He became ill while working on the film but kept working because he desperately needed the money. He had debts to pay. Sometime during or after his divorce, he became romantically involved with silent film star Vamp Pola Negri, and after his death, the ring passed to her. She immediately fell gravely ill. She put the ring away as well and recovered, but her career in Hollywood was effectively over for really no apparent reason. 
sketchy. She met a young Italian-American baritone a few years later who went by Russ Colombo, who reminded her of her late lover. She gifted him the ring from one Valentino to another, she said. A few days later, Russ Colombo was killed by an accidental discharge of an old firearm that his friend Lansing Brown was showing him. The ball fired from the gun had ricocheted off a table and hit Colombo above the eye, becoming lodged in his brain. Surgeons attempted to remove it, but he died a few hours later on September 2nd, 1934. This news was withheld from his mother for 10 years until his death by the rest of his family. They faked letters, they used old records to make it seem as though his radio program was still on the air. It was believed that the news would prove fatal to her as she had been hospitalized with heart disease at the time of his death. Colombo's possessions passed to his cousin, who gave the ring to one of Colombo's friends, Joe Casino. Casino put it in a glass case for a time, spooked by the preceding events, but a couple of years later he apparently decided the curse wasn't real and he took the ring out to wear it himself. A week later, he was hit by a truck and died. <laughs> the ring passed to his brother, Del Casino. Del didn't believe in the curse at all. Just a series of wildly unfortunate events, a coincidence. He subsequently wore the ring for a few years without incident. He loaned it to a Valentino impersonator, who also suffered no negative consequences. And then Dell's home was broken into and robbed. Police shot the burglar, a man named James Willis, and killed him. Apparently, they had meant only to fire a warning shot, but somehow aimed far too low and killed him. He had almost gotten away with the simple quartz ring in his pocket, along with other loot. This event spooked Dell, and he locked the ring away. <laughs> in 1938, a young Olympic figure skater named Jack Dunn requested the use of the ring as he was being considered for the part of Valentino in an upcoming biopic. He wore the ring and some of Valentino's clothing to a screen test and died 10 days later on July 16th from tularemia, a rare blood disorder he'd apparently contracted by handling a dead rabbit on a recent hunting trip. He was 21 years old. Del Casino locked it away again until his passing of natural causes, supposedly. The ring was placed in a vault by his executors in a Los Angeles bank. The bank was robbed a year later. The gang of robbers got away with around $200,000 and the ring. Two of them were caught and three passers-by were injured in a subsequent police ambush. Some of the gang was reported to have been killed by the police in the chase from the bank. Not sure. The ringleader of the gang, Alfred Hahn, was sentenced to life in prison for the robbery and was quoted as saying in the trial, If I'd have known what was in that vault apart from money, I'd have picked myself another bank. After that, the ring went back into the vault and the bank suffered a $50,000 robbery, a fire, and a cashier's strike somewhere between 1960 and 1967. The ring may or may not have disappeared in the fire. It may have been gifted several years later via a radio program by a mysterious owner. They wanted someone to describe the magical powers that it possessed, and if they could, they would mail it to them or something. I don't know. I don't even know if the person doing the radio program thing that called in actually had it. Nobody knows where it came from and nobody seems to know where it is. Some people think it is still in the bank vault. I'm not even sure what bank it was. I couldn't find any information on the bank name. It was just a bank, a bank somewhere in Los Angeles. If anyone can find out that information for me. Maybe just call around all the banks. Are you the one? I don't know why you hold the phone over here. Are, are you guys the, are you the bank with the ring, the, the, the tiger's eye, you know, the one that killed everybody? That ring? That one? Do you guys have it? 
No? Okay, <laughs> just wondering. I don't know. I don't know how to find it out. I couldn't seem to find sources. So the facts I could find sources to somewhat verify end with the death of Jack Dunn, the figure skater. It doesn't mean the rest is untrue. I just couldn't find any articles relating to the deaths of Joe or Del Casino, of the arrest and conviction of Alfred Hahn, or of any of the robberies at the bank, let alone which bank it was, which I just said. It seems this story may very well be half urban legend, and I suppose none of us will ever really know. But if you ever see a ring that looks like this in a shop window, maybe just pass it by. That is all I have for you. I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope maybe you learned something. Researching this gave me an idea of someone else that I would really like to cover, an interesting person, maybe two. I could probably talk a lot more about Rudolph Valentino himself, but I really mostly kind of wanted to give a, a baseline of background information for him and then talk about the ring. So, I hope you enjoyed it. All right, bye. <laughs> Born on May 6th in 1895 as Rodolfo Alfonso Rafael Pierre Filiberto Guglielmi de Valentina Dan Diantanguola. Oh, I'm terrible at Italian apparently. Rodolfo Alfonso Raffaello. Nope. Rodolfo Alfonso Ro. I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it. And he earned himself a certif certificate. You can tell it's been a while, because I can't get any words out of my mouth. Stupid cat. Okay. The sixth highest, I can't enunciate. One of the sixth, sixth. <laughs> One of, and, and the sixth, not, I can't say sixth for some reason. <laughs> The sixth highest grossing film, a uh, silent film. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't think you can, I don't know if you can hear it. And John used his political connections to have Rudolph vet arrested. I can't talk at all.